Many of us in the classical education movement never received a classical education ourselves. And so when we, uh, when we go around talking about what classical education is and how you do it, you have, you have uh, teachers and homeschooling mothers who don't have one themselves and their question is, how do I do this? Uh, how do I get the classical education that I never received myself? And one of my answers to that is to talk about the five great classical books. All right, and, and really it's six, but I'm putting two together because they're written by the same person, uh, namely Homer. Uh, because Western civilization is the, is the civilization of Athens, the civilization of Rome, uh, the civilization of the Hebrews as they were transformed uh, by Christianity and passed along uh, down to our own day. And so, what books would you read? Uh, how, how, would you, how would you get that, that kind of education? I say, well, if you read, and, or at least aim for these five books, five or six books, then you're going to have received what we would refer to as a classical education. The first one would be the Iliad by Homer, also his Odyssey. Uh, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey were very important to the Greeks. They communicated to the Greeks what the ideals and values of their culture were. And that's what you're going to find in the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Greeks' values were strength and intelligence. If we, if we look at the Iliad, what we find is that strength is exalted. The strength of Achilles, the strength of Hector, bravery, a courage in battle, this, this sort of thing. In the Odyssey, we see something a little bit different. In the Odyssey, we see somebody who wins his battles through his own wit and, and, and intelligence. Um, Odysseus of many wiles. The Odyssey is called the Odyssey because it's about Odysseus. Uh, he, he defeated his enemies through craft, uh, through, through his own native intelligence. And so we, we have those two things exemplified in those two books of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And again, I'm kind of counting those as, as, as one book. For the Romans, what book would we look to to see the, the ideals and values of the Romans? Well, we would look to the Aeneid. Uh, the Aeneid is called that because it's about Aeneas. Aeneas is a Trojan prince, and he flees from the burning city of Troy with his father on his back and with his family in tow, and he goes and, and, and goes on a journey, that's what the book's about, and they they land on the banks of the Tiber River and they establish the new Troy, which is Rome. It was sort of uh, Rome's great myth, in the same way that the Iliad and the Odyssey were the great myths of, uh, of Greece and Athens. Uh, so we've got the Iliad and the Odyssey, the, the ideals and values of Greek culture. We've got the Aeneid, the ideals and values of, of Rome. And the reason the Aeneid is good for that is because the Aeneid is about this, uh, this Roman uh, reverence for family, piety toward the gods, uh, and just practical virtue in everyday life. The Greeks were all speculative. They're talking about, you know, the truth in itself and goodness in itself. But the Romans are very practical people. And so they talked about the practical application of virtues. Uh, then we have uh, the ideals and values of Christian culture. This is best illustrated in Dante's Divine Comedy. In the Divine Comedy, you have um, you have this idea that, that that heaven is up and hell is down, and we're trying to journey through this life, hoping to get to heaven, and and that's what the book is about. The first part is about going uh, through the inferno, the second part about um, uh, purgatorio, and the third about paradiso. And he has as his guide through hell, uh, Virgil, the the Roman, who is the writer of the Aeneid, which hopefully uh, you, you, you will have read or read after you read that book. And uh, Virgil is a guy because Virgil represents reason. Uh, and, and Virgil leads him so far, but Virgil can't take him to heaven. Reason can't get you into heaven. This is sort of the implicit message there. Uh, Beatrice comes and leads him the rest of the way. Beatrice, who represents divine grace. So in the, in the Divine Comedy, you see in this great poem written in Italian, um, we see the, the ideals and values of Christian culture. And then two works in English. The, the first, of course, is the King James Bible. And I say the King James Bible because it's that version that mostly influenced our literature and thinking, uh, uh, certainly in, in, in English, obviously written in English. 
Uh, it was it was uh, translated in 1611, and um, and it's it's the book that is quoted in great literature. It's always going to be the King James, or almost always going to be the King James that's quoted. It was it, whatever you think of qualities of translation. There's all these debates that go on about best translations of the Bible, but whatever you think about that, the King James Bible is the greatest work in English. It's a literary work. It's the greatest work, and it's had the greatest influence. And finally, the plays of Shakespeare. If you read Shakespeare, not only will you encounter all these great character types, um, but there are things that Shakespeare says. You know, we often think that in poems, that what does the poem say? We'll give this little paraphrase and say, that's what the poem means. No, the poem means what it says. And there's some cases, and Shakespeare is a great example, uh, where it could not have been said any other way than the way Shakespeare says it. That's what a great poet he is. And if you take those two things, the King James Bible and, and the plays of Shakespeare, um, this is, this is most, most of what, for example, Abraham Lincoln knew. Thomas Jefferson, he had read widely. He had this great library, which he, he willed uh, after his death, and it became the Library of Congress. Um, obviously, books have been added to that since, but it became the basis for the Library of Congress. But, but Lincoln was, was sort of the opposite education. Lincoln was not widely read. He was deeply read. He read three books primarily. Okay? Number one was the King James Bible. Number two, the plays of Shakespeare. And number three, uh, Euclid's Elements, uh, Geometry, where, where what, what, uh, what Lincoln uses to explain what equality is. He uses the geogra geometrical idea of equality. But the, the, these, these books he's so deeply read in, and you read Lincoln's speeches, which are great, great works, and you, you look at them and you can see the influence of the King James Bible and the plays of Shakespeare. All right, so Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid, uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, the King James Bible, and the plays of Shakespeare. Those are the works that we, I think we can aim at, uh, the, the five greatest of the great works. Uh, and, and again, those last two are English people, we're English people, so, so we put those in there too. And we have this, this sort of thing to aspire to. Now, you, those are great works, and, and they can be hard to read, even in good English translations, so you, you need to be prepared to read them. And so, um, so you can find, and, and we have at Memorial Press, um, books that you can, that are retellings in simpler form of these books, so you can get familiar with the story and familiar with the characters, uh, so that when you go to read them, you can understand them much better, because they are hard. But those are the ones we should aspire to. Those are the ones we should, we should try to prepare ourselves to read and to understand. And I think if we do that, just do that, it, it, obviously we need to do more, but if we just did that, uh, we, we'd have over 60% of the education that I think we should have. As we think of education and the, uh, and the classical education movement, uh, which is uh, an understanding of our culture.